Okay, uh, a very good morning to all of you again. Welcome to this workshop on fundamentals of qualitative research. See the unseen, know the unknown, do the undone. Uh, the title is a bit catchy. Uh, you will know why um, we uh, use these phrases uh, for this particular workshop. Essentially, uh, it is about, as I said earlier, the fundamental issues, uh, the fundamental uh, matters pertaining to qualitative research. Um, so the slides uh, will be given to you after the workshop. Um, also, we have a few articles relevant to what we are going to discuss today, and we will send to you after the workshop. It could be tonight or it could be tomorrow. Uh, the reason why I say we is because uh, apart from myself, uh, Agong from Indonesia and Rex from the Philippines will co-facilitate it, will co-facilitate, but they are co-facilitating this workshop. Um, I will spend the first one and a half hour uh, to go through uh, slides um, related to the ABC of qualitative research. Um, I will also talk about idea generation, theoretical grounding, um, and I will talk a bit about method, uh, especially uh, <coughs> uh, qualitative inquiry. Uh, Rex and Agong uh, will then talk about specific methods. Um, so we hope that we provide not only um, lecture, but we, we uh, provide practical experience uh, and examples uh, so that you can adopt something more practical and you can also relate to your own research, your own studies. Um, we will do the same thing in the afternoon. I will spend the first one and a half hour uh, discussing about methodology, um, data coding, data analysis uh, before Rex and Argon will take over and uh, discuss about uh, some specific things related to data analysis um, and also the rigor of doing qualitative research. I will then wrap up the entire workshop uh, by, by discussing with you uh, how you can do reporting, how you can write. Um, so that's about it. It is a one day workshop. Uh, it's actually not enough, it's never enough. Um, hopefully we, we, uh, we uh, cover most of these important topics and you can learn something at the end of the workshop. Um, feel free to ask any questions uh, in the chat room. Um, so at this point of time, we will request you to, to mute yourself, uh, but feel free to write any question at any point of time in the chat room and we will attempt all these questions uh, whenever, whenever we can. Um, so I think that's about it uh, as introduction, as housekeeping. Um, so don't worry about the slides. Don't worry about the articles. Um, my assistant will send to you either tonight or tomorrow. All right, but if you have any questions related to the workshop, not the content, feel free to ask in the chat room as well. All right, so uh, here we are. Um, we will um, firstly talk about um, uh, the fundamental uh, things related to the research. Um, if you don't mind, um, I will use uh, this format because it helps me to know how many slides left I need to cover. I need to make sure I finish uh, in 90 minutes uh, and I pass uh, you know, 30 minutes to Agong, 30 minutes to Rex. Um, so this format is more helpful to me. I hope it is clear to you. All right, this workshop is brought to you by Sarawak Research Society, Emerald Publishing East Asia, Sarah Southeast Asia Research Academy, uh, and UCSI University, uh, Malaysia. 
as I said earlier, uh, with me, uh, Agong from Indonesia and Rex from the Philippines. Uh, and I've said basically everything about the workshop and also uh, what the content is and what we expect at the end of the workshop. Uh, um, it cannot make you a qualitative expert because the speakers are not qualitative experts as well. Uh, we just hope that through our sharing, uh, you appreciate this uh, approach and, and, and you know how to use it uh, as a beginner. Uh, if you have been using qualitative approach and if, if you need more clarification on certain points, as I said earlier, feel free to ask in the chat room. Okay, so these are the, these are the things we will cover today. Uh, we, we try to cover as much as possible, uh, but because this is a one day thing, uh, we will not be able to go in depth for every topic, for every point. Uh, the, the topics highlighted in red uh, are things which will be shared by Agong and Rex. Personally, I'm looking forward to learning from them as well. Um, so they will talk about phenomenology and its inquiry. They will talk about netnography. In the afternoon, they will talk about achieving rigor in qualitative research and analyzing social media data. Um, so while I'm here, you know, providing uh, instructions, um, sharing with you my knowledge, my experience, I'm a learner as well. Um, so I believe this workshop is not only purposeful, meaningful to all of you, it is also meaningful for me. Now, um, we can't really do much interaction. Uh, we are already used to this so-called new norm, um, having meeting in Zoom, uh, not knowing who you are except my friends. Um, so uh, if you wish to answer any question uh, that I ask, feel free to write your answers in the chat room or else I will ask the question, I will answer the question myself, okay? Uh, to, to save the time and to make sure things uh, proceed smoothly. Now, some people say, you know, I'm a quantitative researcher. I'm not a qualitative researcher. So I'm just, so, so at the beginning, uh, I just want to impress all of you. Uh, if, if you have done qualitative research, research before, uh, well, you are a qualitative researcher. If you, are, if you have not done any qualitative research, research before, you might be more qualitative than you thought. Uh, uh, you thought you are. Uh, the reason is because uh, while our research uh, may be mainly on quantitative analysis or qualitative analysis, qualitative research is something so practical. It actually happens every day in our life. Even right now, when I'm observing all of you uh, via Zoom, um, apparently only Winnie opened the, the video. Uh, this is not a hint. Uh, I'm just using this as an example. It's perfectly fine because when I observe uh, Dr. Winnie and when I observe all of you, uh, a static uh, picture, I'm actually doing a qualitative research as well. Um, so observation is a qualitative skill. And more than often, uh, when we provide reasoning, when we provide argument, it also involves uh, a qualitative skill. Um, so you can imagine, um, well, you can't go anywhere today. You are here with, with us. But if you go elsewhere, uh, you go to the campus, you go to a shopping mall, uh, there are a lot of processes uh, where you, you observe things, uh, you reason, you make decision. Um, so, so qualitative approaches, qualitative techniques happen in many, many of these instances, okay? Um, 
I don't want to elaborate too much on this, uh, uh, but it is good to know uh, some years ago uh, in my preparation, uh, we have this Greek philosophy uh, originated from Apollo and Dionysus. Um, in short, Apollonian or Apollonians are those who are logical, who are rational, uh, whereas Dionysus is a person who is not rational. Um, it can be chaotic, uh, it can be disruptive. Now, what I want to say is that um, many times if things are in proper place, if we do what we expect to do uh, and we expect the findings, uh, we expect things to happen the way it should be, and we are in an ideal situation when the respondents give you, tell you what they thought. Well, if we are in such an ideal situation, then you can basically do uh, what is being instructed, what is being planned, uh, and you should be able to get the desirable outcome. However, and in some cases, unfortunately, we are not living in, in the ideal world where things would happen based on expectation, based on what it should be. Example, COVID-19 is not, is not something that we, uh, we expected. Uh, even if you expected two or three years ago, some, somehow you are a, you know, a fortune teller, you can predict the future. There are still many instances, many things that, uh, that are beyond our control. Uh, so when situations like this happen, uh, does it mean we can't do anything? Does it mean we are limited to, a, to, our, to our own place, our house, and we can't do anything? So I, I like to point out that uh, there are situations where we have to think outside the box. Uh, we, have to, we have to go extra mile to inquire for more. And many times, uh, unexpected situation, uh, sometimes unpleasant situation, this is what our human life tells us, may actually present a better opportunity, may actually tell us something else, something more. Now, I'm not saying that when you do a qualitative research, unpleasant things will happen to you. Uh, my, my, the point is, uh, you have to go extra mile. You have to think outside the box. You have to ask why. You have to ask why not. Um, because there may be more truth out there. Perhaps what we see, what we know, are only a friction of what they actually are. Um, and it takes some situations, some unpleasant situations, to help us to realize we need to change our approach. We need to change the way we think. We need to change the way we reason. So when we do research, uh, I'm like all of you, we hope that everything will go smoothly. Okay, we hope everything will go smoothly. However, when it comes to data analysis, when it comes to data interpretation, we realize the results are not what we expected. Okay, even though this is a quantitative study, at that point of time, we may employ a qualitative skill to consider why this is happening. This is my hypothesis. I expect that this to happen. It should be significant, but why it is not significant. And at that point of time, 
I cannot figure out why it is not significant. So this unpleasant situation challenges you, brings you out from your normal self to think outside the box, could there be other reason? Of course, perhaps you do your analysis wrong and then you have to get someone who is well-versed in quantitative data analysis to check your data and you know, all that. But assuming all these are correctly done, so even though you are a quantitative researcher, at that point of time, you need to think as a qualitative researcher. You go through the literature, you think about it again. You may want to follow up with an interview and from there you get, the, you get to know why. Or you look at the context of your study, perhaps demographics, perhaps contextual factors are reason why uh, my findings contradict past findings in this part in this situation. Um, I I I cannot say uh, that you will definitely uh, succeed because different person different situation. Uh, we cannot uh, we cannot you know uh, advise something that fits every situation. What I'm trying to say is because of that exercise, you may begin to see something more insightful. Uh, and because of that process, your theoretical uh, and managerial implications, not only they are, they are, they are, an advancement of knowledge, they also provide uh, implications which are more practically meaningful to the practitioners. Instead of saying the obvious, instead of saying something intuitive, you are saying something that is insightful, uh, that is an advancement of knowledge in theory and also in practice, okay? So as researchers, uh, whether we are lecturers, supervisors or students, I know it is easy said than done. Uh, what, I'm, what I want to say is you have to embrace challenges. You have to embrace situations which are not expected. If you are not ready to do that, perhaps qualitative research is not for you. Uh, but as I said earlier, don't narrow qualitative research to something only hardcore qualitative researchers will do. Don't do that, okay? Uh, even though you do quantitative research, again, as I said earlier, I hope that you learn some qualitative skills so that you can use these skills even though you are doing a quantitative research. Now, if you look at this picture, uh, the first picture may tell you, okay, these are the things I like to interact with my participants, but we better don't waste any time. Uh, I'll just proceed. Uh, so I show you two pictures so you know the answer already. If I show you the first picture, you know, you look at this picture, well, you, you will think uh, automatically uh, the ship is in trouble. Why? Because a dog bites uh, a sheep. Uh, you may misunderstand, you may misinterpret, uh, you may accuse the dog. But of course, some of you out there, you are trained. You never say things too soon. Uh, and if I ask you, you will say it depends. Uh, this is a very clever answer, okay? Why? Because you observe. Now, the, the animal that bites is a dog. It is not a wolf. So it is unlikely that a dog would uh, bite a sheep for, for no reason, okay? So again, that picture will induce many uh, responses, many responses. 
But if you look at the second picture, then you know what is the story. So what is uh, the lesson here? See the unseen. Do you always see everything? Do you see a bigger picture of the phenomenon? Now, when you do a quantitative research, uh, you know what you want to investigate. You know the problems you want to address. And from your research problem, you formulate your research questions. So what you ask, you will want to address. What you did not ask, you do not have to address because these are not part of your research questions. So in a sense, you know what you want to do. And because of that, you limit yourself to what you want to do. There is a specific scope for your study or we call it delimitation, something that you purposely uh, scope so that you can include what is necessary, you can exclude what is necessary. Nothing wrong with it, okay? This is how you see the world, how you see the phenomenon, this is how you approach it. However, for qualitative research, we always ask, is that all? Could there be something else? And also we want to know why why this is happening. And therefore, if you look at the slide, do you always see everything? Do you see a bigger picture of the phenomenon? Do you know that there could be more than what you have seen? And that the unseen, uh, this is the most tricky and challenging part. The unseen actually explains what is actually happening, what is really happening. So if we do something, and it is correctly done, and it helps us to understand what is happening, that is wonderful. At least you are on the right path, you are doing things correctly. But the last statement uh, is also worth considering. What if what you fail to see actually explains more to you? It actually tells you what really happens. Okay, so this is why qualitative research is useful to explore, to not be fixated to what you have already known, to not do something that is obvious, to not be obsessed with only statistical means to justify your findings, your discussion. You actually want to know why and you want to get to the bottom of it. Uh, for practitioners, uh, we know, especially those in the government uh, offices, they are more inclined to quantitative uh, research. They like to see figures, they like to see statistics, they like to see percentage. Um, if you go for an uh, if you go for a research competition, they like to see a model, you know, things like that. Nothing wrong with it. We know uh, this is the trend. Uh, but uh, it, we, we have to be uh, mindful that um, while the statistics may look impressive, do they really tell us what is happening? Do they really tell us what is happening? Um, if, if you do a survey in a company uh, asking how many of them are satisfied with the employer and the employer is actually the person who administer the questionnaire uh, and the target is to get 90% satisfaction level. If you do it this way, most likely the outcome will be 90% and above. All the employees are satisfied with the employer because of the way you do things, the questionnaire, the wordings, uh, the way you administer. And, and um, the reason why I'm satisfied may not be the same as you. Uh, I may be unhappy with the company. It doesn't mean I'm totally unsatisfied. I am satisfied with the company. It doesn't mean I would not leave tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I, I, it doesn't mean that it will stop me from writing a letter to another company uh, waiting for my turn to be interviewed. 
So that percentage may not tell you the full story, may not tell you the full story. Okay. Uh, so that's why, again, if you explore the unseen, uh, you may be able to see something more, something else. Okay. Now, know the unknown. This is an example I gave before in my past workshop. Um, if we look at the picture, again, in, you know, immediately we will say traffic jam. Uh, and most likely it is caused by that, um, that bus. Uh, I don't know what you call it. Uh, the bus with two cables. Uh, so, so the way it turns, the way it is built, it is not suitable at all. Uh, and it is disrupting the traffic and it causes traffic jam. Okay, so this may be what we say based on what we know on the surface. Okay. However, if we explore further, how do we explore further? If we actually go to that place, if we actually know the context of this particular city, we may say something else. Okay. So what is happening here? If this happens in Kuching, where I am, okay, Kuching, the capital city in Sarawak, we may say that, my goodness, this is traffic jam. But if this happens in Jakarta, if this happens in um, Ho Chi Minh City, okay, this is no traffic jam because this happens every day. Um, I like everything. I, I like Jakarta so much, but I hate Machet. Okay, I really, really hate Machet uh, traffic jam. Um, it's like you never, never reach your destination. But anyway, so it depends on the context. It depends on the context. You may say from your perspective, this is a traffic jam. But if you know the context of the study, this situation, you will come up with a total different interpretation. Instead of accusing the driver, instead of accusing the bus, you may start saying this bus is actually designed in a wonderful way. Not only it can, it can carry more passengers, it can make turn in such a tight angle in order to bring people to their destination. Can you see when you know the context, your answers, your findings, your discussions, not only you add something to your findings, you actually change the entire findings. You actually change the entire discussion. Okay. <clears throat> what lesson do we learn? Do you always know everything? Do you know why this is happening? There could be more reasons than what you have known. <clears throat> Especially as I said, if you know what the context is. Okay. You will <clears throat> later on, you will see why qualitative research is something subjective. As a researcher, you are part of the phenomenon that you are investigating. You have to be you have to attach yourself to the reality in order to, to, uh, to know what is happening better. The challenge, of course, at the same time is how can you maintain your subjectivity and your objectivity at the same time. If you are being objective, then perhaps you never, never release yourself from your predetermination. That is not good. If you are too subjective, you may interpret everything based on your personal imagination. And it is not, it is not something true because you are limited to your own background and learning. So this is the challenge. You need to be subjective, but at the same time, there are situations where you need to maintain your objectivity or there must be some mechanism to show that your subjectivity is not driven by your own personal agenda, personal imagination. Your interpretation is definitely useful. However, it must be validated. There must be a way to show that what you think explains 
what is actually happening. Okay. Now, when I say what is actually happening, it doesn't mean you will explain 100%. But if you can explain 60%, 70%, that is wonderful. Uh, for those who are doing quantitative research, um, one thing that we do is we use R square. R square means variance explained. How much is explained by the predictors? So for those of you who are familiar with this technique, if we get 20%, 30%, 40%, it is already wonderful. Uh, but of course, it, can, it, it depends on the, on, 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 the, on the field of your study, on the field of your study. It is when you, when you try to explain human behavior, it's never possible to explain 100%. Okay? Uh, even if you argue that you know, these findings from the sample can be generalized to the entire population, you cannot explain 100%. Um, in the same principle, uh, we cannot know everything. However, when you know the unknown, because you go to the field yourself, you, you uh, how should I put it? Uh, you take off your researcher hat. You, you are still a researcher, but you take off your researcher hat. You put aside all your predetermination. You, you immerse yourself in the context of your study. That is when you begin to know more unknowns. And these unknowns may provide greater details uh, to what is actually happening. Okay. Next one. Do the undone, okay? Uh, no time to do this, but uh, it's very straightforward. If you were to move just one match to fix the equation, what would it be, okay? So some people would say uh, eight, uh, eight minus four equal to four, okay? So you move one match from plus and you put it on six, okay? So eight minus four equal to four, right? Um, now there are, there are a few solutions, okay? So there are actually three uh, or four solutions. We know the solutions. We know how to do this because we have been trained to do it this way. On one hand, we know mathematics. On the other hand, we are trained to see things, to do things in a certain way. What I want to say is, what if I move the plus, the match on the plus, okay? What if I do this? Oops, okay, no worries. Um, eight, minus four is not equal to four. I hope you get the point, huh? Eight minus four is not equal to four. You have, you have an equal sign with a slash. It's not equal to four. That is also, that is also the right equation, right? So what is, what is the lesson here? We are trained to do things in a certain way. We are comfortable with the way we do things. And we trust that by doing the same thing, it will lead to the desirable outcome. Nothing wrong with that. However, if we do things differently, it, it could lead you to something else. It could help you to see something different. And that different thing could be something interesting for you to further explore and explain. Okay, so if you look at the slide, do you always do things in the same way? Do you know that there could be other ways? Example, the, another way to fix this formula or equation. How you do things might limit you and exploring the undone might lead you to something different and new. So if you go back to uh, the philosophical uh, viewpoint of Dionysus. 
the undone may actually lead you to something different. Again, whether you are a qualitative researcher, whether you want to use qualitative skills to do your research, these are all important exercises. For me, this is what makes research interesting. Uh, uh, some people say that I'm a qualitative researcher. <clears throat> I like to see myself as a researcher. Uh, qualitative research is no superior to quantitative and vice versa. It all depends on the situations. And many, many times, it is not just about qualitative research. It is more about qualitative skill that we use in the process in order to make our research interesting. Okay, so I hope you get something uh, from this simple uh, exercise or introduction. Um, I don't know whether this is really, really from Albert Einstein, but uh, I got it from Google, thanks to Google. Albert Einstein said, uh, said not everything that counts can be counted <clears throat> and not everything that can be counted counts. I'm, I'm not Albert, I'm no Albert Einstein. I, 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 uh, I dare not uh, interpret, I, I dare not say what it actually means, but based on my humble opinion, uh, it means that uh, we have to explore uh, something beyond the obvious. Uh, we have to explore something beyond numbers, okay? Because there could be more reasons uh, behind what is on the surface, all right? Uh, over the years, I like to do studies, uh, whether it is a qualitative research or it is actually a quantitative research using a lot of qualitative skills. Uh, so example, the first study, I was served with this plate of food, okay? If you look at this, I'm not sure, even though I'm hungry, I will not be able to finish this. Uh, so, I, so, I, so while eating, I ask myself, what would, what would I do if I cannot finish food on my table? As a parent, I always told my kids, finish your plate, clean your plate, okay? Uh, now I'm in a situation where I cannot finish food for my, I cannot finish food on the table. So, that stimulated my interest to do studies related to this, this, this position, okay? So one of these paper uh, is, is over there, uh, even though it is about smartphone, uh, but uh, the idea is the same, okay? I have another paper uh, with a journal. I don't know what is the outcome yet. It is under review. Uh, it is about teenagers when they cannot finish food, what would they do? Now, if you look at the literature, especially literature from the West, because most studies are done in the West. Uh, as far as I know, you won't, you won't see a paper. As far as I know, there could be, but based on my reading, there is no finding that shows that they will, they will they will dispose food to their dogs, okay? Not uh, in the Western literature. If you cannot finish food. Uh, however, when we conduct, conducted studies in Malaysia, uh, this is one thing that consumer would do when they cannot finish food. And that is, they will give this food to their pets. Okay, uh, in New Zealand, they may say you are abusing your animals, uh, but again, different contexts, different situations. Um, so again, this is why you, uh, it, it extends knowledge and from there you can provide implications. Another study is about selfie promotion. Again, it is based on observation. It is based on observation. So people take selfie all the time. And when you are on Facebook, you see people uh, you see pictures of the person uh, himself or herself with the destination, with the product, with the food they are about to eat. So 
apart from celebrity endorsement, where companies need to spend thousands or millions to get these people to endorse. Now you have a situation where people are willing to take photo with the product, with the destination, with the cafe, without any cost. And if you look at the social media, one, when there is a picture of someone with a scenery, with a plate of food, the comments, where is this place? Why did you not invite me? Uh, uh, you know, uh, how much is it? So I asked myself and I discussed with my colleagues, even though the customers, they are taking selfie for their own gratification, you know, showing off, uh, that could be a purpose. But indirectly, it seems to become a promotion. It seems to become a promotion. So for a, for a small company, they may not be able to pay millions to a celebrity to endorse the product, but they can actually pay nothing, zero, to get these people, customers, to take selfie and they promote out of their own will. After one night, after one week, your cafe, your restaurant, your product are known by hundreds thousands of people. So this study is done, it is a quantitative study, but it began with observation. Okay, finally, I like to go to cafe, but I'm never a coffee drinker. So I began to think, perhaps there are also people like me, we are not really coffee drinkers, but we still go to this place. What could be the other reason? So we use a mixed method approach uh, and we use uh, a philosophical stance called uh, pragmatism because we want to know what is actually happening. Okay, I'm part of the phenomena uh, and I immerse myself into my study in order to know uh, what customers would do at Starbucks when they are not coffee drinkers when they don't go there often. They don't go there often, but they will go there. Uh, so we want to know why. Okay, so again, I hope these examples will help you uh, to understand, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, why qualitative research is done in a certain way and why it is so interesting. Okay, so what does this tell you? Do we always abide to what is designed, what is predetermined, what is given, what is taught, what is understood and allow me to say what is systematized. So things are designed in a certain way, but human being is, a, is, is smart, okay? Uh, even if no one teaches you, you will figure out something. Uh, again, uh, this, is a, this is just an example. Uh, please do not take it personally. Even if we are lazy, we, are also, we can also be innovative in our laziness uh, to, to, to do something, you know, to take shortcut uh, because we are more qualitative than we thought we were, okay? Um, so again, uh, I hope at the end of the day, uh, you don't have to argue again whether you are a quantitative researcher or a qualitative researcher, okay? We need both uh, to be a better researcher, uh, to be a better supervisor, to be a better student. Well, we still need to get our master's, our PhD done. It could be a quantitative research, but for our own good, it is important to learn both skills and this skill uh, for this particular workshop. Okay, again, like I said, uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask in the chat room. I have another um, 40 minutes. So I will cover uh, a few points. Uh, like I said, the slides will be given to you uh, and also some materials for you to read at your own uh, convenience. Okay, uh, introduction to qualitative research. Uh, I, I, I will not want to read the whole thing. Uh, instead, if you look at the second point, 
it is an inquiry process of understanding a social and human uh, problem. So this is just one of the many definitions out there. Uh, so this is not conclusive. This is not comprehensive, but it, 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 it explains the essence of what a qualitative research is. It is, a, it is an inquiry process to understand what is happening in the real world. And, and, and for that matter, you cannot detach yourself from the reality. You cannot stay in artificial setting. Uh, if you do a quantitative research, you may be able to do that. You are in your room and, and by a few clicks, you send your questionnaire to 1,000 people. You don't need to know who they are. That is fine. But for a qualitative research, even if you employ, even if you employ enumer enumerators to collect data for you, to a certain degree, you still have to be, you still have to be in the real setting, in the natural setting, uh, because it will help you to understand what is happening uh, out there. Okay, so this is a very brief explanation. Uh, so it provides interpretation. This is why subjectivity comes into play. Uh, and it does not depend on numerical uh, measurement. So if you collect qualitative data, uh, let's say 10 respondents, eight of them, they agree, they explain why. Let's say there is a situation and they agree and they explain why. Two respondents, they disagree However, they also explain why. And their explanation is detailed, is elaborative. Hence, you cannot conclude that in this situation, yes, is, uh, agree is more important than disagree. You cannot merely depend on numerical uh, measurement or or numerical findings. You have to look into the reasons, the why. Those two persons who disagree may provide valid explanations why they disagree. And from there, as I said earlier, it may help you to see something more. It may help you to know something else, okay? Uh, it, it is about exploring issues, okay? So instead of predetermining what variables you want to investigate, instead of using, you know, a, a fixed theory uh, as, your, as, as your underlying basis to govern, to direct your entire research, you want to explore. Now, when I say explore, later on, I will tell you, it doesn't mean that you do not need theory, okay? I will explain that later. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is, you believe there are multiple realities out there. Uh, you believe that there is more truth to what you know. And therefore, you cannot be happy with these five variables that you predetermine, uh, that you decide at the outset. There could be other things. Uh, lastly, as I said earlier, it is done in a natural setting. Uh, you have to immerse yourself in the real situation. Now, when we do a quantitative study, we would say our questionnaire is our instrument. The survey is the instrument. Uh, however, in a qualitative research, we ourselves, the researchers are actually are also the instrument. The reason is simple. How you do things, as I said earlier, do it undone, how you do things will affect your research, will affect your research. Okay, let me give you some simple examples. Okay, you want to do an interview. Uh, like I told you uh, earlier, the paper which is under review, the, inter the interview was done with teenagers, teenagers. I might be a good interviewer, 
I am trained to be a prolific interviewer. However, when people see my face, they always think that I'm, I'm angry. They always think that I'm a bad person. This is not my fault, okay? I'm born this way. I grew up this way. But if I interview teenagers, no matter how good I am, how, much, how many skills I, I have, the teen, these teenagers will not be comfortable with me. They will not be willing to tell things. They may feel that I'm interrogating them. Okay. Some time ago, I also told uh, some government officials, uh, they, they appointed me as a national consultant <coughs> to do a research <coughs> under the Ministry of Health. I told them, when you collect data, please don't put on your uniform in honor we serve. Because if you do that, you are, they will feel that you are interrogating them because that research is about unregistered health products. Okay, so I'm just using this as a simple example. Uh, can you see now we as the instrument can affect the outcome? I'm only talking about shirt. I'm only talking about face. What about the way you ask question? What about uh, the follow-up questions? Uh, what about the way you interpret? What about the way you design? It's, you know, there is a bias, which I will say later. It is called self-fulfilling prophecy. You know what you want. You design the way you want. You administer the way you want. You ask the questions the way you want. You collect the questions you want. You interpret the questions you want. And guess what? You get the answers the implications the way you want self-fulfilling prophecy okay so you have to be very careful uh now it it may sound very negative but now i want to switch you to the positive side this is wonderful because it shows that you have the flexibility to do things to change things in the process and to to improve things in the process Okay, if I, if I did poorly in my first interview, it doesn't mean I throw away the entire data. I can still use part of the data. But from that experience, I improve. I do a better interview second time, third time, fourth time. And in the process, I begin to analyze the data that I collected. Why? Because you are an instrument. For quantitative study, even though it may be simpler in some ways, it is not. If you collect 100 questionnaire and you realize that your instrument is wrong, what would you do? You, if you're honest, there is no way except throwing all the question away, redesign and redo. Okay? You have to make sure you get it right the first time. And during the data collection process, you don't really know the, your data until you analyze them together. So the, the flexibility, it, it is less flexible. It is not flexible uh, in, 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 in many ways, okay? For qualitative, that process allows you to change. And this is why it could be during the process, you see something else you do the undone and you change your strategy. It doesn't mean the data that you collected before you throw away, they are still useful. But because of that change, you begin to collect something better, something more, something more valid, so on and so forth. That flexibility is very important. Again, if you are trained to to do things according to instruction, maybe qualitative research is not for you because flexibility, embracing uncertainty are some of the qualities a good researcher, including qualitative, qualitative researcher should have. Okay, it is a social process. It opens for interpretation. Uh, even though it is flexible, third point, there must be some procedural 
control. And this is very important. On one hand, you maintain flexibility. On the other hand, there must be some sort of procedural control in order to convince the editor, the reviewer, the examiner, uh, the management people who listen to your presentation that your research was conducted in a rigorous manner. There must be some procedural control. Methodological clarity is very important in qualitative report. report. Uh, so we do not rely on statistical uh, findings, uh, but the credibility, transferability of your findings and discussions are very much uh, dependent on the, the way you conduct your research. Okay, so procedural control is something that you have to take note. Uh, last point on the slide, observation and reasoning skills. I, I don't want to elaborate this. I've said enough. This is why qualitative skills are important. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter uh, who you are, it is applicable. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, there are thousands of textbooks, uh, articles on this. I just want to uh, uh, point out uh, when we do qualitative research, uh, one of the paradigms we can adopt is interpretivist uh, paradigm, okay? Social constructivist paradigm. Now, this is the philosophical assumption uh, where you believe that there are multiple realities out there and it is something subjective. It is, excuse me, it is something subjective. Uh, and because of that philosophical stance, your viewpoint, it tends to produce qualitative data. And you use rel relatively small sample. Okay, I, I, I like to use that word, relatively small sample. Okay, so please don't define, don't fix a number. It depends on the situation. If you interview the most successful businessman in Malaysia, for example, listen carefully, yeah? the most successful businessman in Malaysia, if you, if you manage to interview three person, that three persons are already enough, already enough. You don't argue this is too small. You don't argue this is too big. It depends on the context. You can get hold of Tansri Tony Fernandez, okay, who founded A Asia. Who else uh, you want to look for? Okay, not many people are like him. Uh, if you want to interview um, uh, tourism ministers uh, in Southeast Asia, how many are they? Number one, you may not be able to get hold of them. Number two, if you get hold of them. Two, three, four are wonderful, are wonderful. So it does not depend uh, on the number. It must be matched against your target population. In a certain situation, 10 are big enough. In certain population, 10 are too small. It must be matched against the, the population, all right, okay? But when I say this, you know, there are people out there who are very obsessed with number, okay? They don't check with the context. They just look at the number and comment, this is too small, not enough, okay? Uh, so, so I leave it to you, okay, to justify. Concerned with generating theories or you want to come up with a framework of relationship, okay? Generating theories is already something, it, 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 it's a... Is a high end of uh, qualitative research, but you want to come up with a framework of relationship to show the cause and effect, why these are happening, all right? Data must be rich, it must be subjective, okay? Uh, it must be of practical usefulness, uh, meaningfulness um, to the real world. The location is natural, uh, well, we don't really look into reliability and validity, uh, but again, it depends on the authors. Some qualitative authors, they still use these terms. Some qualitative authors, they move away from these terms. Okay, they look into, 
uh, credibility, transferability, uh, trustworthiness. I believe this is uh, uh, something which uh, my colleague Rex will present later. So we look into procedural control. Now, there are some statistical findings uh, in qualitative research, uh, Kappa Alpha and in order to look into uh, uh, reliability uh, between different quarters, example. But I don't want to move into that, okay? Uh, basically, if we are able to explain how things are conducted in a rigorous manner, uh, you, are, you, are, you are basically fine. Unless, you, unless the reviewer is very particular on certain thing, uh, and from there you can look for more in order to justify. If not, in general, it's all about your reasoning. It's all about how you conducted your research and how you justify, you report uh, um, to, to make a good case of your research process. Uh, last point, it acquires insights, it produces rich uh, information. So if that is your uh, philo philosophical stance, uh, interpretivist paradigm, these are the things that you tend to do. Okay, do not say, I do interview because interview is only a data collection technique. You can use interview in a qualitative research. You can also use interview in a quantitative research. So don't confuse uh, interview with paradigm. Don't confuse interview with qualitative inquiry. Interview is only a data collection method. You can also use questionnaire in a qualitative research. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. So at the, at the beginning, what, how you view the world, what is out there, how you acquire knowledge. These are the things that you have to realize. I try to avoid all the philosophical terms, ontology, epistemology, axiology, and methodology, uh, but basically this is what I'm trying to say, okay, without using all these terms. All right. Um, um, in, uh, in general, we use deductive approach when we do quantitative research. We use inductive approach when we do qualitative research. But again, based on what I said earlier, as a researcher, it's better to do both, okay? Because when you do your literature review, you need both inductive and deductive approach. So it doesn't mean if it is, it doesn't matter whether it is a quantitative or a qualitative research, you have to have both, okay? Uh, but if you have to pinpoint which one is more relevant to a qualitative research, then it will be inductive, okay? inductive. Uh, but if you look at the slide, I use the word approach. So I want to move away from a mere categorization exercise. Uh, it is a skill that you should have. Uh, it is not only useful when you do your data coding and data analysis. It is also useful when you do your literature review. It is also useful when you try to formulate your research problem. Uh, there are so many things to study, so many issues out there, how you deduce them, how you induce them will also be very, very useful, okay? Now, the next part, uh, I will talk about briefly uh, about um, idea generation and also the use of theory. Uh, on one hand, we observe. On the other hand, uh, it is still important. It is still important uh, to base your research on, 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 on some theories. Uh, so let me let us go to the next part of, uh, of the slides. Okay, oh, well, so this is another slide showing uh, why it is, uh, why a qualitative research always involves iterative process, iterative process. This is why uh, deducing, inducing, uh, 
uh, both approaches are very important. Okay. By the way, uh, there are many authors writing different papers out there, uh, and there are different schools of thoughts. So, in this workshop, uh, my position, I don't take sides. Uh, I explain what I explain what is I believe useful to all of you. Uh, whichever side you take, it is fine. Make sure you have the articles to support your case, uh, because it is a scholarly work. You should base your arg argument on past literature, uh, but at the same time, uh, you provide your critical reasoning. You will make your voice heard uh, in your in your writing. All right. So uh, just be sure that you understand. Uh, I don't take sides. Okay. All right. The mere formulation of a problem is far more essential than its solution, which may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental skills. To raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard all problems from a new angle requires creative imagination, and that may mark real advances in science. What I said earlier, see the unseen, know the unknown, do the undone. How you formulate your questions in a real sense is more important than how you get the solutions. If you ask the wrong questions, even if you get the solution, it is wrong. The entire study is basically wrong. To come up with new questions, to see new possibilities, to do things differently yet more effectively, that is actually a real advancement of science. And that does not begin with the software. That does not begin with application. It begins with you, a researcher, as an instrument. Okay. So again, I hope you are clear. The responsibility is on us. Where does idea come from? What if I have no idea? What if I have too many ideas? How to turn my idea into a researchable topic? How would I know if my idea works? If you are, if you are a master or PhD student, how would I know if my idea is worth, uh, is at the PhD master level? I got this, I have these questions all the time. What's next? Well, we don't have all the answers for you. <clears throat> Again, uh, whatever I'm lack of, uh, um, um, the sharing from Rex and Argon would complement. That's why I must make sure I finish on time. Huh? Uh, but anyway, uh, like I said earlier, I don't want to go through all these um, terminologies. What I want to highlight here is the first thing. Many, many researchers overlook this. They overlook this because they are not aware of it. They overlook this because they are told, they are instructed to do this and that. And therefore, you, you have no option. You have to do it. This is something you do for a grant. This is something that you do for your KPI. Again, it is not a matter of right and wrong. What I like to point out is, what do we actually value? Okay, if you look at the statement there, what do you value in your research? This is important because your values affect how you conduct your research and what you value in your research findings. Now, this is something that may not affect your research outcome from the perspective of getting it done, from the perspective of getting it published, from the perspective of uh, fulfilling your KPI. So if you think that way, nothing wrong, okay? Nothing wrong with that because we have to survive. Uh, allow me the flexibility to say that as a researcher, uh, I emphasize a lot on value, a lot of on value. If this is something that do not produce any meaningful meaningfulness, uh, it only it is only useful to make a show. It is only useful to get it published. For example, very likely I will not do it. Uh, 
because I am doing something against my conscience. I'm doing something against my ethical value. It is, I'm doing something against my value. Okay. Like I said, I just put this forward to you. It is up to you to adopt or to not adopt. Okay. Uh, but this, but, but this is what axiology is about. Um, today we live in a systematized world and therefore many things change. We have to do things in order to survive. I sympathize, I empathize, uh, but we hope that while we do research, while we write papers for publication, do not forget uh, why we started in the first place. Um, so let's do something meaningful because that value will actually guide you what you need to do for your research. That value is actually the very source of the ideas that you think you are lack of. Or there could be too many ideas. What are the most valuable ones? I'm not saying that this will lead you to a conclusion. As far as I'm concerned, many times, this helps me to generate ideas or this helps me to narrow down my ideas to decide what I want to do. If I write a proposal for a grant, if I write a proposal for a company, uh, recently I submitted two proposals to a ministry. Uh, both proposals were accepted. Uh, now I'm waiting for funding. Uh, I put my value in the proposal. On one hand, yes, I wrote in the way they wanted so that they agree and they will support. Example, they will definitely want to know the outcomes. They will definitely want to know the budget. Okay, we know that these are things that they will want to know. Examples. However, I do not want to lose my voice. I also write certain things in the proposal to show why the passion is there, why it could be more valuable than the expected outcomes. Okay, I, want, I would not want to elaborate more. Uh, so basically, this is what I do. And we attend conference, we attend workshop, uh, we work with different people. This is where the idea is from. You get ideas not only from literature. Yes, you must read. You cannot run, run away from that. But at the same time, one of my experiences is that I get ideas by mixing with different people, uh, talking with different people. And when I, when I mentioned different people, it includes practitioners, practitioners. Uh, again, it relates to my value. Okay? I want to do things which are of practical meaningfulness uh, to the community concerned. So this is a, this is a, a, a nationwide project. Uh, some years ago, I did with, uh, oh, well, I was appointed as a consultant. Uh, it took two or three years to complete. Uh, we came up with a report. The report was well accepted. Eventually, I told you know, all these uh, officials from different states in uh, Malaysia, why not we turn it into a paper? Uh, eventually, we submitted to a journal. It was accepted for publication. Okay, so if you read this, uh, this is by Professor uh, Hulan. This is a big name in marketing. Uh, so if you read this article, it tells you why it is so important uh, to collaborate with practitioners. Uh, for my presentation today, I want to tell you that it is so important to think about the practical world, to talk to practitioners, in order to generate ideas, put your value into it and do a research which is meaningful to you, meaningful to the community concern. Of course, it will also get published. It will, you will also get your master and PhD after that. But the value, the benefits are beyond, okay? Are more than all the obvious, all, all, all the obvious. Okay, so once you have the ideas, uh, then you can, you can start to define what the purpose of your research is, 
uh, what are the appropriate methods, uh, and you have to evaluate whether you can do it or not. Uh, some students, they, they come up with brilliant ideas, brilliant topics. They are so conscious. They are so worried about their topics, their titles. Many times I would just cool them down, calm them down, and let's be practical. And that is point number three. Let's evaluate based on this idea, based on this topic. Can you do it? Is it feasible for you to do it? If you want to complete your master's in two years, if you want to complete your PhD in three years, in four years, can you do it within this time frame? If you want to do this for the rest of your life, for the next 10 years, because this is something of your passion, by all means, go ahead because you have all the time you need to do it. But if you are bound by time, so feasibility is always very important. Do you have the sources? Okay. Sources. Okay. So this is why uh, it's, it's, you have to think through. You have to think through in order to decide whether this is the research problem you want to do for your research or not. Okay. Uh, you can go through the rest. But for qualitative research, many times, these are the things that you can consider to justify why it is a qualitative research. Number one, research problem is not clearly defined. This is why you want to explore. There could be something else. There could be multiple realities out there, and you have to be subjective in the exercise. It is difficult to develop a specific and actionable decision. This is another reason. The research objective is to develop a detailed and in-depth understanding of some phenomena. You want to know a lot of why, okay? So that's another reason. The research objective is to learn how a phenomenon occurs in a natural setting and, how, and to learn how to express some concept in colloquial terms. And, you, and, that's, and therefore you have to be at the natural setting. Uh, you have to talk their language. Instead of proper focus group discussion, you have, to be, you have to engage yourself in a community discussion uh, in order to understand things in their words, to not lose the meaning behind the words, okay? Uh, so that you can extract, elicit, uh, valid data for your analysis, for your discussion. Okay, so you have to be in the natural setting. Uh, let me give you one example, uh, observation and participation, uh, which we will talk about later. In some situation, it is better for you to observe by being a participant. In some situation, it is better for you to observe and you should not participate because if you participate, your presence will affect the data, okay? Because they see you there, uh, suddenly they change the way they do things. Sorry, they change the way they behave uh, and they say things differently. So you should not participate, but there are situations where you should participate. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you employ, ethnography, uh, you need to stay with uh, the local people for, for three months. This is where you need to be in a natural setting. You need to put aside everything that you know. You don't insist things right at the beginning. You become a good listener. You engage in the activities in order to understand things without disrupting uh, their lifestyle the way they communicate. Okay, again, it depends huh, what research you are doing. The behavior the researcher is studying is particular context dependent. Okay, I don't have to elaborate further. It is highly dependent on the context of your study. That's why for certain uh, uh, research, they employ case studies. There could be four cases, five cases, six cases. Why? Because even though the research objectives are the same, yet these different cases have different contexts 
and you need to use qualitative approach in order to understand the data based on the context, based on the context. In this case, case study may be more useful as your qualitative inquiry. Okay, a fresh approach is needed to study the problem. Okay, as I said earlier, different perspective, different approach uh, in order to study an old phenomenon. Uh, again, it does, it, it is in line with what I said earlier, uh, your paradigm. Uh, there could be multiple realities um, and the problem is not well uh, defined. Therefore, you need to explore further. Okay, um, even though we explore things, even though we don't adopt a, a, a theory uh, as the underlying basis to formulate your hypothesis, to develop your framework, uh, you know, in a quantitative research, when you have a theory, when you have two theories uh, to develop your framework, it provides you the uh, systematic explanation, what is happening. And you can always use that to explain what you include and what you exclude. What you exclude doesn't mean they are not relevant, but you can always use theories as your theoretical argument to exclude certain things uh, because it is because uh, because your framework uh, based on theories uh, would be enough to explain the phenomenon under investigation so that is for quantitative for qualitative <clears throat> there are two schools of thoughts okay of course it all began uh I'm not sure whether that is the absolute origin, but anyway, uh, it, uh, it started uh, when uh, Strauss and uh, Gla Glacier, after they came up with the grounded theory in the late 1960s, 1967. After some time, they went apart. They went separate ways. Okay, one still believe that uh, we need to rely on data everything emerging from the data, okay? Another one, yes, we need to look into data, but the way we do things, there must be theoretical grounding as a basis for us uh, to, to, to elicit data, uh, uh, to elicit something from the data, okay? so. Again, I'm not on either side. Uh, I, I, I believe two, all these two points are valid. But if you ask about my experience, I'm more inclined uh, to Straussian, Strauss side. And that is when we do a qualitative research, uh, we still need theoretical grounding to support us, okay? However, you have to be very careful. If you have strong theory to support your study, then your examiner, your editor, your reviewer will always ask you, why not you employ a quantitative approach? This sounds like a quantitative study. So this is where you have to do things carefully. You, you believe there are multiple realities out there. You employ a qualitative approach. You use certain theories as a basis to support what you want to do, okay? They do not predetermine what variables you want to use. I hope you see the difference, huh? They support, they give you basis. What are the things you want to explore? Example, you use theories to support that they are situational factors. What are these factors? You need to explore. You use theories to support that they are interpersonal factors. They are motivational factors. 
they are external factors. What are they? You can refer to the literature. Nothing wrong with that. But you are not sure whether all these variables are also applicable in your study. And therefore, a further exploration, a further investigation is needed using these theories as the grounding to find out what are the situational factors, what are the internal factors, what are the motivational factors, so on and so forth. I hope you get the point. Huh? And this is why if you look at the last point, critical reflection is important. You cannot just adopt, plug it in, incorporate, that's it. No, critical reflection is important uh, because in the process, you may see something else. You may do something else and that allows you, they may, that may cause you to change your strategy a bit. Okay, so um, these are the elements of uh, theory. We want to explore the what, we, we want to explore the how, how meaning the, how they are related. We also want to explore the why, okay? And also as, we, as, as I discussed with you earlier, uh, the, the, uh, the study is often context dependent. So what are the contexts? These contexts are the boundaries. The who, uh, the, the who, the where, the when, and you know, basically these are the boundary, the context of your study. Now, do you, do you are these important? In many, many ways, these are very, very important. Why? Because when you study things, you have to consider the context. And when you analyze your data, not only you use the findings to discuss, you can also use the boundaries to, to support what you discuss. You may not be able to find literature. This is just an assumption. Huh? You may not be able to find literature to support certain things that you found. You can always use some logical explanation from the boundaries, from the context to support what you want to explain. Be careful with the word I use. Huh? The reason why I say so is because these boundaries may not be part of your research. Therefore, you cannot claim that these are your findings. Nevertheless, these can be useful to support what you want to argue. Okay, if you have literature support, that's great. If you don't have literature support, because of this logical explanation, you will be able to introduce additional literature, not as the main support, but as an augmented support to support what you try to argue uh, in order to justify your findings. I hope you get the point. Huh? Um, at the end of the day, it is never enough to argue that context is your contribution unless you submit to a law tier journal. You cannot use that as a knowledge, as a, as a knowledge contribution. Because I do this in Malaysia, therefore it is a contribution. Most likely it will not be accepted. However, Boundaries and context are often useful to support your argument. They may not be able to be the main reason because you are not researching on the context, but they are useful to, uh, to, to complement, to supplement uh, your findings and your discussion. Again, I hope you get the point. Uh, in a qualitative research, we are mostly interested with point number three, why? Okay, without number one and number two, there will be no number three. If you have number one and number two, this is a good research, but this may not be enough. We want to know number three. That is where your novelty, your contribution come from, okay? 
Now the rest I will not explain because I just want to show you all the theories once upon a time they actually came from a qualitative exercise. Okay, so I leave it to you uh, to read. TPB, wonderful, very popular uh, psychological theory used in various disciplines. Once upon a time, it all began with observation. It all began with uh, uh, interview, a critical reflection. Okay, uh, and because of that, theories are extended. Okay, theories are extended. People change, society changes. You cannot, you cannot stay the way you are, you were many years ago. Okay, so again, a qualitative uh, research is useful for us to explore, to extend, uh, to generate theories, new theories. Okay, um, there are many types of theories. Uh, there are grand theories, theories which come with explanation without framework. Okay, there are many theories out there which come with explanation without framework. These are theories which you can use in your qualitative research as theoretical basis to argue why you do things, why you explore things in a certain way. Okay, TPB is a theory that comes with a framework, uh, but there are grand theories out there which you can adopt and you can argue. Okay, resource based view, social ex exchange theories. They do not specify the variables, but they give you the basis to conduct the research. Okay, there are also micro, uh, micro theories uh, which are designed for specific purposes. Uh, we don't want to go into that. Okay, so this is a book that you may want to look at. All right, theories are uh, qualitative research is useful to general items. Okay, I don't want to go into details. Uh, qualitative research uh, is uh, is useful in different disciplines. Okay, uh, even in a quantitative dominant discipline such as information system. Okay, uh, it is useful to address research gap. Okay, again, something you can read. Again, it is useful to address your knowledge claims, okay? Uh, I, I was in Melbourne, I visited this professor. Uh, so he wrote this article. Uh, he was the senior editor of MIS Quarterly before. MIS Quarterly is one of the top journals in the world across all discipline, okay? So, so uh, how you draw conclusion from your sample to make it meaningful to the population and because of that, qualitative exercise is also very important. All right. Okay. So this is where I stop. I, uh, sorry, I exceed five minutes. Uh, there are many ways to do research. So, so uh, if you look at this diagram, uh, I hope you can see research methods. Okay. Action research, case study, phenomenology, ethnography, grounded theory, uh, netnography. So whatever it is, uh, essentially uh, the rigor, the process, the clarity must be maintained, okay? We definitely have no time to explain all these details. However, Rex will explain to you phenomenology and Argo will explain to you netnography, okay? Don't confuse research inquiry with data collection technique, okay? Because when you employ uh, phenomenology, you can use multiple techniques. It doesn't matter which tech, well, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. You can use multiple techniques, okay? So, Interview is not qualitative, is not equal to qualitative research. Huh? So I hope I make this clear. Uh, so with that, I will stop here. Um, Rex Agong, are you there? Uh, you are, each of you uh, is given 30 minutes. But 
if you need to spend more time, it is perfectly fine. Uh, 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 no worries. So I'm not sure whether Rex or Argon should go first. I pass the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Haram. We already agreed with Agong that I'll go first and he'll follow. Yeah, thank you so much. Can I start now? Yes, please, Rex. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haram. Uh, and uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, good morning, Agong, and to all who are here in the Zoom room. As uh, mentioned by Dr. Haram, this is just a form of knowledge sharing. And so therefore, I'm wishing that you will also learn from me. And my talk will uh, revolve uh, around my, uh, my experience in conducting um, qualitative research, specifically phenomenological uh, research. So we have here a phenomenolo phenomenology and its inquiry. Once again, my name is Rex Lim from the Philippines. It's supposed to have an activity actually just asking you what you have observed uh, given the picture, but then uh, I know that I only have a uh, very limited time, so I'll just skip this one. Actually, the emphasis of the picture, I mean, of asking you uh, your observation about the pictures that you have uh, seen now in your screen is just to emphasize that um, qualitative research um, um, demands uh, multiple reflections, demands multiple um, analyses, and that uh, meanings are in people and sometimes reality are distorted given that we have different perception, given that we have different perspectives, and that's the very core of qualitative research. So I'll go directly to this uh, slide. Uh, looking back to the research design, which is, uh, according to Creswell, uh, re uh, our plans and the procedures for research that span the decisions from broad assumptions, okay, as what uh, Dr. Haram said, assumptions of qualitative research, of quantitative and different um, views, okay, worldviews, epistemolog epistemological, ontological uh, worldviews, axiological, to detailed methods of data collection and analysis, of course, relative to a particular assumption. Hence, Creswell identified three types of research designs. We have quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods, which the very core of our talk, uh, my talk uh, this morning, is um, qualitative specific for phenomenological study. And I have here the term immersion design specific for uh, qualitative research. It's emergent because it's evolving. You cannot, although we said, uh, for example, at the onset that you would like to study qualitative, phenomenological study, for example, but then as you go along, you'll be able to discover, uh, as you go along, you'll be able to know something that can probably change your design or that can probably change the method as well. Okay, so that's how flexible, flexible uh, qualitative research is. So phenomenology is an approach to understanding people's everyday life experiences. So that's very clear. It's about making meaning, finding essence of the lived experiences of the people. But in uh, but the, the first thing that you need to do, you have to properly identify and qualify uh, what is a phenomenon. Okay, so you can proceed to the study of phenomenology. So what is the essence of this phenomenon? as experienced by these people and what does it mean? So it answers the question, the, what is the essence of this phenomenon as experienced by these people and what does it mean? So looking into the description of the phenomenon and looking into examining what, this, this, uh, what does this uh, phenomenon mean to the participants? So that's the, 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 the contention of, of phenomenological study. So phenomenology has its disciplinary roots in both uh, philosophy and psychology. So it says here that the historical movement of phenomenology is the philosophical tradition launched in the first half of the 20th century by Edmund Husserl. So there are figures in quality in phenomenological study. We have Husserl, Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Jean Paul Sartre, and many more. But if you read uh, literature, uh, more or less, you'll be uh, reading or seeing Husserl, and we have Heidegger. So that gives us the two main schools of thought in phenomenology. We have descriptive phenomenology being espoused by Husserl in 1962. So descriptive phenomenology, it answers the question, what do we know as persons? So merely describing, okay, the, the lived experiences, the experiences of, of the participants. So it's philosophy emphasized descriptions of human experience insists on the careful description of ordinary conscious experience of everyday life 
a description of things as people experience them. So these things include uh, hearing, seeing, believing, feeling, remembering, deciding, evaluating, and acting. So what do they hear? What do they see? What do they believe? What do they feel? That will be captured in the uh, analysis using uh, descriptive phenomenology. So descriptive phenomenology includes uh, the following levels of analysis, bracketing. So bracketing is a very technical term. It's a technical term for phenomenology, which uh, simply means that, that we have to withhold our own assumptions, our own experiences, our own prejudices in the analysis of the data. So that's what we mean by bracketing, because remember, you're simply describing okay, the experiences of, of these people, of your participants. So therefore, we have to hit, withhold our own assumptions in the analysis of the data. And we have also the term intuiting, which basically refers to uh, our openness to for possibilities of, of, of possibilities of looking for more, okay, from the, the, the shared experiences of the participants, because we cannot be absolute, although they share, but then we can still look for more, we can still expect for more, okay, in their sharing, and we'll have analysis, basically, that's, uh, that refers to the extracting of significant themes, categorizing them, and then making meaning, of course, of their experiences, so that's uh, what we have here, describing, making a meaning, uh, a finding essence of their uh, experience. And we have also another school of thought, interpretive phenomenology, although phenomenology, but uh, it's interpretive. This uh, rose against the um, descriptive phenomenology because uh, according to Heidegger, we cannot completely bracket our own experiences, our own assumptions in the analysis of the data. Hence, we have interpretive phenomenology, where there is now an allowance of the incorporation of our own perceptions, of our own prior knowledge. So what is being? Okay, He stressed interpreting and understanding, not just describing human experience. So uh, when Hasterl described, I mean, had a term bracketing, Heidegger had a term, a reflexive bracketing, where there is an emphasis of an attempt to identify internal um, uh, suppositions to facilitate greater transparency, but without totally withholding okay, our, our, internal, um, our internal processes, our own, uh, our own um, um, prior knowledge. All right. So that's uh, interpretive phenomenology. And what we usually do, uh, more or less, in, 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 for example, in education, since I'm into um, education, okay, uh, we do interpretive phenomenology. So these are the key figures when we talk of phenomenology. Georgie, Georgie and Georgie, Husserl, Mustaka, Scoots, Wagle, Van Manen, they are figures in, in, in phenomenological study. But basically, these are this, the list is not exhaustive. So therefore, there are still many uh, proponents espousing the study of phenomenological study. So let's take a look at the sampling procedure and sample very quickly. So qualitative sampling, I guess, uh, Dr. Haram already made about this refers to the selection, uh, selecting and appropriate situations and participants that hold true and rich uh, pieces of evidence of the phenomenon under study. So it's very important that in qualitative research, in phenomenological study in particular, that we able to get participants who have first-hand experience of the phenomenon or else we can uh, do nothing about uh, the analysis and getting the lived experience. So generally, qualitative research sampling is non random or purposive, given the fact that we have to uh, properly qualify who will uh, those um, qualify, okay, participate in our study, given the characteristics, of course. So uh, we uh, the following are guide questions in identifying our samples. Who would be an inform information-rich data source for my study? Whom should I talk to or observe to maximize my understanding of the phenomenon? Who can, who can confirm my understanding? So basically those who have rich experience of the phenomenon challenge or modify my understanding. So that's why we have a negative case sampling, deviant case sampling to challenge, okay, your understanding, very important, and enrich my understanding. So these are some of the questions that will guide you in looking for uh, appropriate samples of your uh, study. So this is emergent, even in the process. I mean, in the process of selecting the sample, it's still emergent. It's evolving, depending on what tra what transpires, okay, along the along the way of of conducting the study. So what are the key features of samples? Number one, 
participants are not selected randomly, basically, since it's purposive. There are certain criteria before you can invite them to be part of your study. Samples tend to be small and studied intensively. So generally, samples tend to be small and you're going to study them intensively based on context, of course. Sample members are not wholly pre-specified exactly, although uh, you may have, uh, you may refer your number of samples to a particular rule of thumb, but basically you can do opportunistic sampling of what will arise as you go along. Sample selection is driven to a great extent by conceptual requirements rather than be a desire for representativeness. Conceptual, re uh, conceptual requirements refer to the data saturation that you have to stop uh, looking for samples if you've reached the level of data saturation when information given by your participants are simply uh, um, uh, redundant okay, or repetitions from a uh, previous participant. So that's the very time that we have to stop looking for samples relative to our study. So I, I'll be showing to you, I mean, discussing to you some of the basic uh, sampling uh, procedures or techniques okay, in qualitative re research, which are very useful in phenomenological study. So we have convenient sampling or volunteer sampling from the word itself, volunteer. Okay, You're, you can provide a notice with the qualifications and then you'll be looking for volunteers. Okay, if they feel that they qualify, then they can contact you. It says here that volunteer samples are especially likely to be used when the researchers need to have potential participants come forward and identify themselves, yeah? And sampling by convenience is easy and efficient, but it is not a preferred sampling approach, even in qualitative studies, because, yeah, as what I mentioned, it's highly biased because, um, from, um, because you can just uh, post there an information asking for volunteers with, uh, of course, the list of qualifications, and whoever feels that he or she is qualified, then he or she will uh, contact you. So more or less, it says here, according to Monster and Court since 2018, it's not uh, preferred even in qualitative research. But then you can do that in case you are re you really do not know who to look for, okay? Or you have a scarce um, participants for your uh, for your study. Another is snowball sampling or chain sampling. This is uh, asking early informants to refer other study participants. Okay, we can do snowball sampling or chain sampling when the uh, problem or yeah, when the problem is very sensitive that you didn't know who to look for. So if you're able to identify someone who possesses the characteristics, okay, of your um of your participants, then you can ask this someone to refer you to potential uh, participants. So this happens when the researcher identifies one person who possesses the quality of a participant he she needs in the study and requests the participant to refer him or her to another potential participant. So basically, this is cost efficient and practical, given that you'll have to have like um, referral sampling. Okay, another term for this is referral uh, sampling technique. So researchers may have an easier time establishing a trusting relationship with new participants, yes, because um, it's being referred by someone you know, okay? Sample might be restricted to a rather small network of acquaintances. It's, you'll just be revolving around the people whom you know. Quality of the referrals may be affected by whether the referring sample members trusted the researcher and truly wanted to cooperate. Yes, exactly. This is another issue when you do snowball sampling because you do not know exactly that person. This person is just being referred to by your friend. So this is another um, um, issue. That's why we have to build rapport Okay, when we do uh, interview later on Okay, if they agree uh, with their participation in your study. Purposive sampling, uh, we also have here, this is a broad term which refers to selecting cases that will most benefit the study. You have the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So this sampling technique is suitable when the researcher uses his or her judgment on the, on the most qualified participants able to provide rich information about the phenomenon under study. So this is usually utilized in ethnographic research, okay, referring particularly to a particular group who can or particular people who can give you rich information about uh, your study. So according to Creswell 2002, these are all types of purposive sampling, but then Creswell divided uh, the, the uh, I mean, categorizes the uh, purposive sampling techniques into two. We have before 
for data collection and we have after data collection. We will just uh, go over the following. For the intent to develop many perspectives, we can use maximum variation sampling, very specific, a very, very helpful and important and phenomenological study where your participants include uh, represent, uh, representatives some various demographic profile, including age, including um, educational attainment, occupation. So you can get a diverse, um, uh, diverse answers yeah, or diverse experiences given your um, sample. Um, problem, I mean. Next, we have to describe particularly troublesome or enlightening cases. We have extreme case sampling, okay, to challenge your finding, all right? And to describe some uh, subgroup in depth, in depth, we have homogeneous sampling. Homogeneous sampling is uh, very applicable when you do a focus group discussion, all right? Since uh, your participants in focus group dis discussion must be more or less homogeneous so that they cannot uh, be feeling inferior with one another. So there is no much, uh, there's no so much gap uh, with each other. And to describe what is typical to those unfamiliar with the case, we can have typical uh, sampling or representative of the case. To generate a theory or explore a concept, we can have a theory or concept sampling or theoretical sampling, okay? Very uh, um, a particular as well to uh, grounded theory. All right. After data collection, Chris will um, um, list it down opportunistic sampling to take advantage of whatever case unfolds. Since you're done with your data collection, okay, and you would like to, to, to try out whether uh, some samples can actually confirm or disconfirm your data, so you can do opportunistic sampling. Somebody, I mean, uh, samples that may just arise along the way, okay, or may just come along the way that you feel can actually confirm, can actually enrich the data, so you can do that. Uh, opportunistic sampling is good in, in, in phenomenological study, but usually used in ethnographic study, where you go to the field, you do not know who to look for, although you're done with your data collection, but then you'll just meet Meet someone, okay, uh, unexpectedly, and you you'll able and you'll know and you identify that this someone actually qualifies. All right, your study. We have confirming or disconfirming sampling to explore confirming or disconfirming cases. Again, another way to validate and to challenge your data. And we have snowball sampling, the one that I already mentioned, to locate people or sites to study or referral sampling technique. So it says here that you can mix and match the sampling techniques which you consider appropriate in your study. So you can begin with like maximum variance sampling, then you proceed to opportunistic sampling, depending on the methods, uh, of course, in your research design. We can mix and match, meaning they are not mutually exclusive with each other. Like if you started off with um, or with um, maximum variance sampling, you'll be devoted to maximum variance sampling up to the end of the study. So you can mix and match as what it as what the as what it says. I mean, I, I showed a while ago. Um, qualitative research is highly emergent. It's evolving. So what about the sample? I know Dr. Hiram will talk about this this afternoon, but this is just to um give um, uh, details okay, about samples of qualitative research and for phenomenological study in particular. So samples generally refer to the participants or respondents of the study. They are the key informants of your problem. Some authors coined um, key informants specific for um, ethnographic study, but some authors as well just uh, mix or blend informants and participants. So it really depends on the author. So there are no fixed rules for sample size in qualitative research as what Dr. Hiram uh, mentioned. In qualitative studies, sample size should be based on informational needs, whether um, uh, you have already saturated the data, that's why it says there, data saturation, whether uh, you have just uh, repeat, uh, repeatedly uh, found similar um, experiences, similar sharing, similar answers from your um, participants. If that's the case, if you have saturated the data, <clears throat> that's the time that you have to stop uh, looking for samples in your study. But what affects uh, sample size in qualitative research? So basically, data quality. That's why you have to be very keen at looking for samples of your study, samples who possess the quality and characteristics of what you look for in your study. So data quality, so they can share, okay? So you can exhaust 
okay, all the information you need relative to your study. Sensitivity of the phenomenon, yeah, if the phenomenon is very sensitive, so therefore, you can just look for a small sample as well, okay? Availability of shadow data. A shadow data um, actually is um, uh, proposed by uh, Morse, okay, 2020. Um, shadow data need to be verified. Um, shadow data is referring to the participants' uh, reports about others, of what they share about other people. So it, by, by, by looking into, investigating to uh, shadow data, you know what to look for, who to look for. So very important that uh, you can look for uh, quality participants so they can provide you with shadow data. Okay, so in such a way, it gives you uh, a more convenient manner uh, and, and, and will aid you who to look for and what to look for, given the sharings of these participants. And skills and experience of the researcher as well. That's why Dr. Haramid mentioned about it that um, um, very important that when we do qualitative research, um, we should have the, the experience, we should have the skill, especially in conducting an interview because, you know, uh, major, uh, the major um, methods, okay, in qualitative research uh, is, um, or yeah, uh, uh, are interviews, okay, it can be focus group or in-depth interviews. So the skill, in, it's a skill, questioning is a skill, and so therefore we have to know how to properly ask questions in order to elicit what we desire, okay, what we need in our, in our study. Um, however, there are many proponents or there are many experts or authors proposing certain number of samples, okay? For example, in like case study, Creswell 2002 proposed that there must be three to five participants. Phenomenological study, we have Creswell not, uh, is equal to or not uh, less than 10 interviews. And we have also more, so more than six, is, uh, six or more than six. For grounded theory, Creswell proposed that there must be 15 to 20, okay? Creswell 1998, 20 to 30. And we'll have ethnographic study here, according to Creswell 2002, one cultural group. And according to Morse as well, at least you have 30 to 50 interviews. So in phenomenology, so uh, we must have at least the following as uh, proposed by Creswell and Morse. They proposed this one, um, um, According to, to literature, because this is um, very political, you know, especially when you are um, applying for, for, for a funding. So you cannot just uh, indicate there that you rely on, on data saturation. So that's why they pre-specified pre certain number of, of participants so that there will also be... Um, so that the funding agency can determine or can identify proper amount or appropriate amount for the study. But basically, the very concept of, of, of sample size here in qualitative research is data uh, saturation. But given that um, uh, the, our, our participants or our samples are of quality, so this number of participants can, uh, can also suffice. So for the data collection um, of, of of qualitative research or in phenomenological study in particular, it's very flexible and it's more fluid, okay? And it's also emerging, all right? As you go along, you'll notice that you can do actually unstructured interviews, okay? You can begin with unstructured interviews, which, is, uh, which are very conversational and interactive. And uh, the mode of choice when researchers do not have a clear idea of what it is they do not know. So at the onset, especially if it's uh, your first meeting with them, you can just be very uh, unstructured, very conversational, just to build rapport. You can also do focused or semi-structured interviews where you have your interview guide questions, okay? Which is a list of areas or questions to be covered with each uh, participant. So that gives us the focus group which is a carefully planned discussion with a small group of people on a focused topic. So the group setting and group dynamics are integral to focus group data collection. So there is an overlapping here of answers. So basically, so very important that you have to properly document your focus group discussion by a video, okay, audio video recording. So you'll know who are uh, sharing, who, who are these uh, overlapping voices, something like that. So they can be properly transcribed. So some of the characteristics of focus group discussion includes, yeah, small group. It must be small group. How small is small? That's, that must be um, qualified. Homogeneity of membership, meaning to say if you have your, let's say we have homogeneous uh, sampling. Like if you have a group of teachers, then all teachers. If you have a group of students, all students. All right. So that there will be no much gap. 
okay, in their membership. So therefore, they, they could just properly share their experiences. Non-relationship of members in a group, like you cannot just cho you cannot choose um, teacher, then you have you have the student or else the student cannot properly share. You know, the, the, the relationship, um, presence of moderator, of course. So why use FGB um, if there is a group norms and normative expectations, all right? If we are, there is an inherent, okay, shared expectations by certain groups, opinions and perspectives, very important, reactions and responses, and we are very concerned on reactions and responses, okay, by the members of a particular group, problem solving and brainstorming and group processes and, and group dynamics. If we are into it, if we are, more particular about this, then we can use an FGB. All right. I'll not be reading all of this because I'm running out of time. But here are um, here is uh, the checklist of the responsibilities of conducting an FGD. So very important. You'll be able to determine an appropriate place where you are going to conduct an FGD. So it must be noise free, of course, since you will be interviewing and you'll be recording. You'll be having the the video recording as well. Video recording is very important in FGD, so you can capture the context. And the people, okay, you have you should be able to to manage the people, okay, overseeing or conducting all needed confirmatory communications with the participants who, who will be uh, joining with your FGD, who will those who, who negate the invitation, okay, making sure all participants complete any uh, needed paperwork, for example, the informed consent, receipt of incent incentives, do not forget the incentives, confid confidentiality agreement, and so on. So you'll have to manage people as well. And the things, okay, just like what you have seen in your screen, you need to have the following equipment, okay, the microphone and the other devices, recording devices, <laughs> all right, um, and handling and maintaining incentive payments, informed consent agreement, confidentiality agreement, and incentive receipt forms and records. So we have here collecting, labeling, and organizing all focus group outputs, okay, part of your responsibility, all right. And returning or delivery, return or delivery of all equipment and data or outputs to their location or recipients. Is um, this equipment are or is uh, very important in recording the interview? This is uh, the documentation actually when I, when I did my focus group discussion. As what you can see, we actually uh, I actually booked a function room of a particular hotel. As what you can see here, uh, we have uh, certain equipment. We have here the microphone. We have the speaker actually and it's also videoed and they they were labeled tagged uh, with a particular pseudonym okay uh, as what we can uh, see that uh, very important that we have to house them in a particular venue where uh, um, a venue conducive for for sharing okay when you conducive for sharing and we have to properly record really not just the audio but as well as the video so strategies for qualitative data collection aside from focus group discussion we also have in-depth interview it's a conversation designed to elicit in-depth uh, elicit depth on a topic of interest so very specific or particular and applicable for phenomenological study so part of the characteristics are one-on-one -on -one, basically since this in-depth interview okay so you can explore primarily on 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 the on, on the phenomenon use of open ended question yeah uh, we must be able to share their their experiences use of inductive probing it sounds technical but inductive probing just refers to um, developing your question based on the responses of of the participants they should because your participants must be able to feel the connection and so you develop the questions based on uh, the responses of the participants you cannot just uh, although you have your interview guide questions but you cannot be robotic that you have to follow one two three four and five no it must be conversational it must be casual and so therefore you have to develop your um, um, act of questioning based on the responses of the participant or of your participant rather use of conversational style so you feel uh, comfortable so they feel comfortable with you when they share their ideas or 
of their experiences. So this is just a simple documentation of of, of my IBI. Actually, <laughs> just a, yeah, a picture. And these are the the people. These were the people who helped me a lot in the conduct of an IBI and also of an FGD because you need manpower. Imagine the, the the things that you need to secure prior to the conduct of an FGD, even in the conduct of IBI. So you need people who help you a lot. Look into some of the nitty gritty aspect of conducting your interview. So how long will the interview take? So I, I noted here, uh, according to the suggestion of Nastasi 2016, I suggested a 10 to 20 hour interviews. This, this is now the total, okay? Uh, is sufficient according to Nastasi for a quality qualitative paper. However, depending on the method used in the study, the R per interview may be adjusted. So basically, so if you have 10 interviews, then you can just have one to two hours. If you have 20, according to, this, to Nastasi, you have 30 minutes to one hour. Uh, um, if you have 30 interviews, 30 sets of interviews, you can have 20 to 40 uh, minutes only. Because if you will have uh, just a small amount of time for the interviews, maybe the quality, just maybe, just hypothetical, okay, the quality of interview may be uh, jeopardized, yeah, because we have to, to probe, okay, we have to go deeper, and so therefore, we have to provide, I mean, to allot enough time for the conduct of an interview, all right? So suggested sample size as well for data collection method. If you have key informant interview, according to Nastasi, at least you have five. For focus group, according to guests and others, five to 10 persons for focus group. Number of focus groups can be two to three. So separate focus group, focus group one, focus group two, focus group three as a sort of triangulation or to confirm data. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, yeah. For the focus group, according to Kruger, same thing. Uh, there are many experts who are suggesting um, uh, required Okay, sample size. I mean, suggested, sorry, sample size. According to Kruger, six to nine participants. Langford, six to ten participants. Six, uh, six to 12 participants, according to Johnson. Okay, six to 12 participants, according to Bernard. And Boog, uh, Boom Garter, eight to 12 participants. And for in-depth interviews, according to Dworkin 2012, you can have 25 to 30 interviews. Again, they're just a simply suggested number of, of, of sample sizes, suggested number of participants. We'll have to go back to the very core of qualitative research that is um, uh, data saturation, okay? Data saturation. And you have to be very keen at looking for the samples of your participants in such a way that they are, um, they are, uh, uh, they have the, the first-hand experience of the phenomenon so that you will not be, uh, you will not have a problem, okay, for the quality of the data you need in your study. So that would be all. Here are the references. If you would like to look up, uh, to read more about what I'm presenting to you, here are the references. Once again, thank you very much um, um, for this time, Dr. Haram. Thank you. Thank you, Rex. Uh, this is such a... Uh, fruitful, informative uh, presentation. Um, there, is a, there is a question. There are two questions, actually. Uh, perhaps we can go to these questions uh, before we pass the floor to Agong. Um, the, the morning session will stop at 12, so we still have, a plen we still have plenty of time. Um, Rex, uh, there is a question on shadow data. Would you want to answer the question? Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm now seeing the question. Uh, yeah. What is the uh, importance of shadow data in qualitative study? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, as what I mentioned, shadow data referred to oh, what is, uh, uh, you have your group of, you have your participants and they're sharing with you. And somehow in the process of their sharing, they'll be able to include some information that will aid you a lot in looking for more participants in your study. So basically, what is the importance of shadow data in qualitative study? It uh, it makes your life easy because it aids you in looking for for participants. It aids you in looking for uh, for for data, what to look for and who to look for in your data. Very specific when we do um, ethnographic study, for example. Okay, since uh, their sharings will uh, help you a lot because uh, they may be able to share with you information uh, relative to uh, to some prospect participants in your study. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, hope I give justice to the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that is good. Uh, it, again, it depends on what study uh, the researcher is doing. So uh, uh, in addition to asking for his or her opinion, 
it may be useful to us. Uh, is this the opinion of others as well? Of course, they are criti they are actually criticism on shadow data. But again, if if we explain, justify clearly uh, from the beginning why uh, these are included in your interview protocol. Uh, there's, there's always uh, multiple ways to do things. Uh, and if that helps you to explain what is happening, uh, and if you do it correctly, why not? Um, so in many instances, it may be necessary to ask the person, uh, what about the opinions of others uh, in order to get shared out data uh, to complement the findings. Um, another question, Rex, um, earlier, uh, can the purposive sampling be used in, oh, quantitative research? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my own understanding, of course, based also my orientation, purposive sampling cannot be used in quantitative research because the very core of quantitative uh, research is um, we have to reach certain level of generalization and that therefore the sampling technique must be, must be random. Okay, because if it's purposive, then therefore we cannot make a certain level of generalization. So for me, um, purposive sampling cannot be used in quantitative research. But in some cases, uh, yeah, in some cases, for example, um, there are some cases where you need to establish certain criteria, although this is quantitative. But then when you have, when, when you're able to identify now the population, okay, although purposively done, but you can do like, um, although purposively done, but you can do like um, um, simple random to the population you already identified. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what my uh, that's my stand on it. So generally, okay, generally, um, purposive sampling can cannot be more or less used in 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 quantitative research, given the very nature of of quantitative research. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Rex, I have to disagree with you uh, a little okay. bit on that. Uh, <laughs> well, basically, the reason is the same. Uh, the reason is the same because there are also situations where uh, it is not possible to reach out to every subject in the population in the quantitative study. And, but you actually mentioned all the keywords. Uh, so therefore, we need to set up some criteria uh, so that we can distribute the questionnaire to these respondents in a more purposeful way uh, to get more valid data. Uh, but in general, again, what Rex said is correct. Uh, in an ideal situation, uh, we hope that our findings uh, through the sample can be generalized to the entire population. It just so happens that uh, we are not living in the ideal situation all the time. Uh, some respondents may not be available. Some respondents may be aware. Uh, the way we administer, somehow it did not reach them. Uh, as such, uh, simple, random, simple, uh, simple random may be compromised may be compromised. So, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say uh, I disagree with Rex. I actually agree with him. It's just, uh, there are different perspectives uh, to it. So if you look at, if you read uh, many books um, uh, for quantitative study, by all means, uh, go, for, uh, go for random uh, because that would be the best way to generalize uh, the findings from your sample to your population. However, there is a caveat, and that is there are many situations where we can't, we simply have no way to make sure that every person in the target population uh, is given chance to be sampled. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, random sampling is compromised. Uh, and in, in, in that situation, perhaps, uh, one of the non-probability sampling technique we can look into is judgmental or purposive uh, sampling uh, technique. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, the presentation later by, uh, by Agong. We, we look forward to that because when we do studies uh, on consumer behavior on social media, uh, there is simply no way for us to know who are using, who are not using. Uh, it's difficult to define the population except by setting criteria. Example, he or she must have used social media four hours uh, per day. Uh, uh, so, so, so setting criteria would be the way 
uh, in this situation uh, for us to sample the respondents, even though it is a quantitative study. Uh, but for qualitative study, Rex has made it really, really clear. The presentation was clear. Um, we are not concerned about generalizability. Uh, we want to get rich information in order to explain, to provide more understanding about the situations. Again, take note of what Rex said earlier, even though there are guidelines on uh, sample size, uh, we still have to ensure data saturation is uh, achieved. Of course, data saturation is another hot topic. Uh, how, how do we report? Uh, because we can, we can only write one word. Data saturation was achieved, full stop. Um, so be careful, some examiners and reviewers may ask, can you show me how is it achieved? Uh, so make sure you do the homework, um, you know, uh, your emerging data, and then why it is repeated, why there is no more new information from all the subsequent uh, respondents. Okay, Rex, I, I should have given you um, another additional 20 minutes, uh, but the good thing is that the whole thing is recorded. Uh, so for the participants as well, uh, for the participants, we will not only send you the slides when the, when the recording is ready, if you think you need to listen to uh, all this again, uh, you can always uh, listen, watch the recorded video. Rex, we will get back to you again this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Agong, don't worry about the time. Uh, we can finish at 12. Uh, if you finish before 12, uh, three of us can address questions again if necessary. So over to you, Agong. Oops, I think he's disconnected. <laughs> so Agon is not here now. Oh, he's back. Hi, Agon, are you there? Hi, Agon. Hi, Dr. Hiram. Can you set me as a cohort? Yes, yes I just did. Over yeah. to you, Agong. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, audience, participants. I will share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Perfect, Agum. Perfect. Okay. Okay. This one. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And right now, I will uh, share my experience, yeah, my experience about one of the research methods, especially in ethnography, ethnography and uh, relation with the big data, the big data, uh, we call it a ethnography. Uh, let me uh, introduce for the background why ethnography is very, very uh, popular today uh, during in the pandemic uh, COVID-19. In advanced uh, information technology, especially the development of the social media have created new social interaction with the hope the presenting the quality of uh, information in decision-making. Uh, start with 1990, uh, increasing the internet access and then the development of behavioral research as a subgroup of traditional uh, ethnographic research, yeah often called virtual ethnography or ethnography, a method designed to study online culture and communities. And uh, Robert Kozinet said the research includes way to handle large digital data sets, navigating challenging ethical area on the online world and address the public intellectual aspect of ethnographic uh, participants. Okay. Okay, um, 
on this slide, uh, I will show the tree of ebook from Robert of Cozinet. And the ethnography that I know and study so far has been heavily influenced by the great teachers. The inventor is Robert Cozinet. I found out from one of the webinar and since following what uh, was conveyed, I then independently browse and explore and learn uh, via YouTube by similar uh, webinar to attend conferences organized, uh, organized by various qualitative association, one of which is uh, Asian Qualitative Research Associations and Qualitative Research uh, Consultant Associations, which I am also a member of, of uh, their organizations. I previously studied what is called ethnography, a method that is closely related to cultural communi communities, customs and local wisdoms, especially in Indonesia cultures. But the pandemic period is still required to be productive in producing writings, research, and uh, of course, for the publication. The physical methods are not possible and ethnography uh, provide opportunity to conduct uh, research with large resources and, inform and information uh, technology support. And in my opinion, uh, the three books are very relevant and play an important role in understanding the process of the ethnographic uh, method. And in addition, being active and having various accounts on social media is also a support uh, a supporter of the success of conducting a ethnographic uh, research. Okay, uh, this is the. Uh, Briefly, in uh, information, the introduction by Ayat Musen Aljani as uh, editor in, in Social Network with the title of book, Internet Communication Technology for Reconciliation. Uh, when the uh, one of the part chapter of this book is applied uh, pronounces ethnography in internet research methodology. Uh, on their uh, research, yeah, on, uh, on, on this book, the ethnography or ethnography on the internet is a new research design that adapts uh, ethnographic research technique to study of culture and communities emerging through computer mediated communications. And based on this, uh, the researchers, yeah, the researcher in this book illustrate that other in the community and on the other side side of the wall yearn for peaceful coexistence, the economic prosperity, social triangulity, and the reconciliation. And the purpose of the ICT research was to understand the role of new platforms, as well as to explore and discover ways in which the use of ICT could have part in the transformation process of changing citizens to inspire social change toward healing the bitterness in the community. And the uh, communication research explores some concept, concept and methodologies for a more comprehensive approach to online uh, ICTs for social transformation and social change. And it includes procedure for the analysis of analytics of online social network and investigate different results from the use of the, uh, from use of the analytic. This study was intended uh, to help researchers in the field of the social and behavior sciences with some knowledge of research design uh, methods. And this study also helped researchers implement the mixed method experimental uh, intervention research designs and deploy qualitative quantitative tradition for an online social network during the ethnographic approach. Uh, the, uh, the research was intended uh, for an ethnographer, yeah, we call it the researcher in ethnography, ethnographer, uh, who want to conduct internet communication research. Yeah. Moreover, it is for researchers who want a uh, social uh, structure for ethnographic design, the applied social network analysis from, uh, from YouTube, from uh, Facebook, from Twitter, LinkedIn, and many data sites that develops what we call it big data. Uh, the quantitative and 
qualitative content analysis as the method of analysis interpretation uh, develop more understanding to changing the phenomena. Okay, and one of the core framework for the research was to identify and review other work completed on those different theories, concepts, and approach, approach to develop a skeptical understanding for the use of those methods in various studies. And by this book, the ICT's technology for the reconciliation also want to advance more understanding the innovation and the contribution of information communication technology achieved from the integration uh, of, uh, of those approach in the field of online social uh, network. Okay, this is the uh, example, yeah, the sample, the point of, uh, of the ethnography in the tourism, yeah by Roxhart Tafakolis and Sarah in tourism management uh, uh, per perspective, yeah, they're finding the systematic uh, review yeah, with the category categorization of journals based on the disciplines. Of course, uh, the point is the ethnography and the type of a uh, platform of the field of study, mm -hmm. the empirical material co collection methods, data analysis uh, techniques, and the framework employed in the study. Uh, the author decided to include material other than peer review journal articles since book chapter and research notes a similar peer review processes, or we call it double blind reviews. And there, uh, the researchers, uh, the, the, the researchers exclude the conference paper, books, letter, and edits and editorials on the general belief that they don't make a significant contribution to knowledge developments. And ever since the advent of the internet, it has become increasingly important to analyze cyber cultures. Yeah, to attend to this need, many approach have been employed to try to gain some understanding of online culture. And by causing it, ethnography as a qualitative approach to studying online communities through an ethnographic lens is one of these methods. Okay, and. The researcher also uh, made a framework, yeah, made a framework by user generated content or UGC, yeah, referred to Macno and Markwell 2004, uh, 2014 as a guideline for designing and conducting their ethnographic studies. 60 studies out of the 116 did not mention a reference to framework for conducting their online ethnographic research. What is the contribution, what is the finding of this research? The existing of many diverse platforms and communities on the internet provide scientists and social scientists with a great opportunity to use the net as means as collecting data and conducting uh, field work. And, and the investigation of the data collection and analysis, analysis method that uh, employed in the study showed the focus of researchers were more on tourist experience while most of this data was collected through textual communications. So the, anal the analysis, yeah, the analysis in thematic analysis was found to be most commonly applied analysis techniques. Okay, uh, the other uh, example of the utilization of ethnography as a tool for the understanding, yeah, especially in uh, customer-based research in marketing-based research uh, by Christina Henoman and Gustav Medberg. Yeah, this uh, this paper aims to review how ethnography as a method can help service researchers and practitioners to be better use such uh, data. And uh, as you can see in the table three with the application, with the descriptions, and also the table five in marketing services, there are some uh, list of the key question and the consideration for utilization of the ethnography. Okay. 
the understanding uh, customers is a key aim of service marketing research and an important requirement for successful service business practice. And today, service customers are increasingly active online before and during and after interaction with service provider, which create large masses uh, of information about their activities and uh, experiences. And much of this information is published uh, publicly available and present and present new opportunity for more personalized higher quality uh, surfaces and uh, as you can see in the slide in table uh, in table three the application list of uh, the role of the researcher uh, the description, the researcher can be passive observer, active participant, by explanatory research. This is the type uh, condition of researcher uh, doing ethnography. When the researcher entry, entry to the online the community, they can be accessed in active or passively with the special condition like uh like uh, admin can accept or not you while you enter to the community online and this is the domain of the data uh, the, the, the data collections it can be consists of the online discussion forum uh, ref uh, review sites the social networking site non-commercial website and corporate website blogs email yeah the content include text, picture, video, and the analysis. Uh, you, we can use thematic analysis, content analysis, discourse analysis, semantic analysis. You can use uh, you can use all this analyzed by the manual, yeah, by the manual process, or with the qualitative software like Envivo, like uh, Leximenser. And the combination with the other method, ethnography is very, uh, very uh, humble yeah, to combine with the other method like the interview, uh, of course, the ethnography, the observation, the survey, and the ex uh, 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 especially in the net, yeah, for, uh, in the net or online networking. Okay, uh, this is the the others yeah the other what uh, what what i say that ethnography over a specific set of analytic approach and oh. process applicable across a spectrum spectrum of online involvement while the focus on uh, gaining access to an online community also clearly distinguished between participant observation and non-participant observation as you can see in the in the article yeah this is the article from indonesia yeah from indonesia with the title the information sharing and mechanism in online community uh, the study aims to analyze what information is shared by member in uh, customer to customer community and what uh, and what is the information sharing mechanism mechanism that implemented on it uh, to conduct the to conduct this this research, uh, the researcher observing one uh, one thousand and two posts, yeah, posts from the social media is a bukalapak, uh, bukalapak the co community for six months, and they classified uh, classified by keyword, yeah, the by keyword or theme or content in five classes uh, categories like tip and tricks idea. Pro, uh, idea problems uh, of, it, of, of features, community, and question and answers. And for the the other uh, the other area, the ethnography research also for community insights in the cosmetic industry. This is why, like uh, I mentioned before, that mostly the utilization of ethnography in marketing. Uh, area in behavioral cust customers yeah uh, in this uh, example yeah, this article in cosmetic industry 
So the the ethnography an innovative research approach to extract and use online community dialogue for research and innovation purposes. And there are five methodological methodological steps yeah for the ethnography. The, the, the definition of research field, identification and selection of online community, community observation and data collection, data analysis and aggregation of insights. And uh, last tra translation into product and service solution. This is the the process, yeah, the process to community and cultural context in ethnography. We we already define what the theme and the research context, and then we choose the the community online on on Facebook, website, Instagram, Twitter, and other media. And also we have to uh, we ethical aspect yeah when you uh, when when we report when we report the, the 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 data to analyze we must hidden yeah we hidden the name hidden the name of the organization but we have to show uh, what uh, what classification of the online uh, communities we and we enter we entry yeah and then we we the next step yeah this is the participation and observation uh, in, in direct direct communication or a lurking we we shadow like we shadow yeah we, we shadow as a participant in this community and after we get uh, collect yeah collect the data we uh, we have to uh, uh, we have to see the considered of the data is a relevant is a recent is uh, the quantity the, the 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 quality of the data the descriptive and the, uh, and the detail and this is the and the result is the content uh, for the content analysis yeah in my experience i always use the software yeah software to uh, to data uh, analysis and data collection, yeah, especially in uh, social media. And 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 N5O is most uh, powerful software to to do the analyze. Okay, uh, I think this is the uh, my uh, my last uh, slide for the ethnography. Uh, this is uh, some of the considerations of um some of the ethnograph ethnographer faces in the following complications. Uh, number one is user contact information might not be available in, in profile. This is referred to the ethical conduct. And on some platform, user use pseudonyms or avatar, which make it difficult to verify, to identify. And the user may be dispersed in national or even international territory. For logistical reason, the informed consent from uh, form could be sent over the internet, but the validity of the document could be questioned due to the uh, due to the digital format. And I think in the ethnography also we use the interview when when we try to more explore or more uh, try to look the answer of the our research question. Yeah, even the particip uh, even the participation and the communication in online communities, and uh, submitting written and informed concern turn would involve obtaining the postal address of the user in addition to the high cost to the researchers. So that's why in the ethnography, because it's only use the internet, so I think uh, the cost is can be minimized, and the number of post and user could be too large to carry out the bureaucratic uh, process. This is the one of the challenge when we use the ethnography as a research method. Yeah, we, we face off the big data, very massive data. When, when, I, uh, when I made a conclusion for my research using ethnography and uh, try to publication, when, when uh, the the paper is already submit yeah uh, after 5 minutes the conclusion will uh, it can be changed yeah it can be changed it depend on the uh, it can be it depends on the situation of the network social network i think uh, 
that's my uh, presentation for the introduction of the netnography. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Hiram. Thank you, thank you, Ago. This is a very interesting thing, uh, something which uh, is relevant um, to, uh, I guess, to most of us because we are living in the digital world today. Um, Agong, you mentioned uh, in the last slide some of the challenges um, that uh, nanographers or researchers who use nanography would uh, would encounter. Uh, now. Uh, in general, uh, um, when we collect data from the uh, natural setting and when we collect data from all the platforms, uh, even though we argue at the beginning that it is important to be in the natural setting, it is, it is important to go to the field, but things have changed so much. Uh, some young people, they may not say much in front of you, but they may say a lot uh, on the internet. Uh, so how would you see uh, this trend? Uh, it seems that virtual platform has becoming more and more natural uh, to some people, and it's more feasible to collect data. Uh, now we are in the COVID-19 situation. So, so in a sense, research can still continue because so much so many things are happening uh, on the internet. Uh, Agon, would you like to comment briefly? How would you see the trend of qualitative research? Uh, are we moving more from natural setting to artificial setting in this situation? What do you think? What's your take? Okay, uh, I think in this situation, maybe in the in the in the further in the future research agenda is mostly used. Uh, mostly use the big data, yeah, based mm. on the social media data, mm. because uh, when we uh, collect, we don't need to uh, like the per, per, like the permission, like the permission it, it, in ethnography indirectly, but in ethnography, uh, uh, the permission is uh, permission is uh, is of course is must be. Uh, must be yes for the administration in the uh, the community online yeah but in ethnography we can achieve um, more and more uh, more uh, more data more data more big mm. data that's the the one uh, challenge yeah? the the one challenge for the researcher and mm. how to how to minimize that challenge in the first time when we uh, start to decide uh, I use ethnography. We already know the research question first. The mm. research question is very helpful to researchers to make uh, li make the limitation. Yeah, make the limitation for the uh, maximize uh, the maximize the data. Mm. And then the second is the the what uh, community online to mm. enter. Yeah, to enter. We mm. can use Twitter. We can use YouTube. We can use uh, Instagram, but in my experience, Twitter, Twitter data is very powerful. Yeah, it's very powerful to mm. to 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 analyze. Yeah, to analyze to because uh, because many analysis in the qualitative research can be done in mm, the mm. in the Twitter. Mm. I already use uh, content analysis, the thematic analysis, sentiment analysis, and. And uh, and, uh, and and today, social network analysis is uh, famous, is uh, popular, uh, mm, mm. conducting in uh, ethnography. I think it's the it is a, a opportunity to our researchers mm. in the COVID nineteen uh, conduct with ethnography yeah. and collect data from the social media, yeah, mm. from the Facebook and. Uh, the consideration, the terms and con consideration for the Facebook, we cannot collect in uh, personally in the personally account just mm. for the groups, yeah, just for the groups. For mm. the WhatsApp, what for the WhatsApp group, yeah, for the conversation in the WhatsApp group, it, it can be analyzed, yeah, it mm. can be analyzed mm. in uh, qualitative research. So mm. uh, my experience, I use a software to to analyze that. Uh, mm massive data mm, mm, that's mm. my uh, opinion 
Yeah, thank you, Agong. Uh, so I guess it really depends on uh, what our research is about. Uh, what are the research problems, research questions, what we want to address. Uh, in, in some situations, like what Agong described earlier, uh, big data uh, will be needed and therefore data mining will be an essential process. And in that case, it is advisable to use a software example, NVivo, uh, to, to, hand, to handle uh, big data uh, in order to, to, uh, to, to, to analyze uh, the data on, online. Uh, so this is definitely uh, one of the trends uh, of course, uh, the fundamental, the traditional method, I believe it is, it will still stay for, for a while because there are situations where uh, the, the, the depth of the data is more important than the breadth of the data. So it all depends on, on your research. Uh, that's why I, I look at uh, the slide earlier, uh, it also, sources may also include blog, for example because for blog, people tend to describe more. They tend to say more. Um, now, software definitely is useful, uh, but do remember uh, some of the fundamentals of uh, qualitative research. Example, researcher himself herself is the instrument because the software may facilitate, but at the end of the day, the researchers have to make sense, have to provide meaning uh, to, uh, to all these data. Um, so yes, um, I think Agong uh, said earlier, uh, netnography uh, is, is, uh, is a qualitative inquiry um, through the lens of ethnography, if I, if I uh, said it correctly. So uh, that's the question from Eileen. Um, because the traditional, so to speak, ethnography uh, we always think that we have to go into the natural setting, immerse ourselves uh, into their lives. Um, uh, if you don't do that, you will, you, you, it will be difficult for you to understand them. Uh, but again, destructive technology, social media have changed things so much. Uh, so I still uh, believe that uh, the, fundament, the fundamental concepts are still relevant, but the way we do things, we can change. Uh, we can change. Uh, and, and plus, with all the software, uh, the improvement of algorithms, uh, applications, mechanism behind the software, they can pick up more and more things which they could not uh, in the past. Okay, uh, is there any question? Let me check. Um, for a scenario of remote teaching, uh, does not meeting physical physically the students, who would you proceed to collect data, especially remote teaching in COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation? Uh, Rex, Argo, have you met uh, this situation before? Um, we, you have to do remote teaching, something we are doing now, and you need to collect, you, you need to collect data. Um, how would you do it? Uh, Agon, what, what, what's your take before we yeah. um, have Rex respond? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Aswin, uh, Aswin, for the question. For the remote, teach, for the remote teaching, like, like the, we use Zoom or online meeting, that's uh, the, the, the Zoom the, or the online meeting have, uh, have a facility to recording, right? For the recording, so we can use the recording also for the uh, as a data collection and next process to do analysis. But uh, but so many activities to look at what is the uh, the natural the, the the setting of the the recording yeah the the, the recording or by uh, remote teaching because we have to. Uh, we have to interpret what they what what the what they behave, what they ask, what they uh, the question or uh, they uh, type. Yeah, the type. Yeah, we look that. Uh, for example, 
uh, is it they uh, said uh, positively or negatively sentiment about the about the about the issues about the problems mm. so we, we can we can collect we can collect uh, from the recording yeah. and also and also we can transfer yeah we can transfer the recording into a text yeah into text that mm. for the textual yeah for the textual analysis and we use the discourse analysis and then we can say uh, this is the uh, for example this is the cause or cause and effect of the uh, of the problem mm. and also we can uh look at this the the sentiment also mm. that's that's my uh my opinion about the thank uh, you teaching thank you argo what what's your take rex on this question i could not add more <laughs> Agu, uh, <laughs> perfectly said uh, yeah yeah perfectly answered the question i yeah. strongly agree mm. so we can actually do recording we can actually turn the conversation into uh text for for further analysis of course, it also depends uh, on what research that is about. Uh, so, so we can still we can still uh, you know get things done. Uh, even right now uh, on the on, on Zoom platform, we can also conduct a virtual interview, a virtual focus group. Uh, in a way, COVID nineteen uh, shows us many things that we can do which we have not thought about in in the past. Uh, when we talk about focus group discussion, for some reason, I always thought in the past, we had to come together, you know, uh, there must be refreshment, you know, all, all that. Right now, we can actually do focus group discussion with anyone in, in the world. Uh, the, the fundamental concept is still, uh, we, we, still, we still abide the fundamental concept, for example, like what Rex said earlier, uh, ideally five to 10 people. So these are the things we can still keep. However, the way we do it, we can improve because, so I can still do a focus group with a Taiwanese, you know, a Vietnamese, Indonesian, five to 10. Moderator is still very important. That does not change. Uh, we want the particip participants to be diverse. Still, that does not change. Um, but uh, digital platform definitely uh, provides something interesting and apparently COVID-19 uh, teaches us to rethink a lot uh, what we have done in the past. So, um, so let's move on to the uh, next question. Um, research question come first or research objective come first? In quantitative or qualitative study, Rex, do you want to go? Do you want to try that? <laughs> um, what's that again? Um, Basically, I, in, in our research uh, writing, in our whether it is a qualitative or, or quantitative report, should question come first or objective come first? Well, uh, in, uh, based on my experience and maybe based on some theory, we have to um, establish first the purpose of the study and we have to anchor our questions based on the purpose of the study. That's my take on that, Dr. Haram, that the mm. purpose of the study must be established first and then uh, we have to narrow them down. I mean, we have to narrow it down uh, by means of having the, the, the research questions. Thank you, Rex. Uh, Agong, you want to respond to that or you're happy with the, the answers? <laughs> yeah, it is a, a challenging question. The challenging question: or what is the first uh, research question or research objective? Mm, mm. In my perspective, as a qualitative researcher, uh, we can we can decide it first the research question, so that uh, it can be uh, it can be the uh, li the limitation to mm. look at the the data mm. and. Uh, and the five first, uh, we don't know about the question. We don't know about the, the objective. We just enter. Yeah, we just enter to the activity, to the phenomena, and then we 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 collect, we collect the all data, and then we analyze it. And the final the final stage is uh, to construct, to construct the the framework, to construct the theory. Mm. And mm, I think mm, uh, I think of both of the activities we can choose in in the first. Uh, mm. uh, in the first, when we decide to to do research, 
Mm, mm, that, that, mm, mm. That, that's my uh, perspective. Thank you, thank you, Agong. Um, I I uh, agree with uh, Rex and Agong. I would like to add one more point. I assume this is a question from a, a master, a PhD candidate, and therefore I will provide my response accordingly. Number one, the best thing to do is to follow your university's guideline. Uh, is 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 very subjective for us to 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 say whether. RO should go first or RQ should go first. Uh, look at the uh, guidelines of uh, your graduate school and refer to your seniors' work, uh, even though their success does not guarantee our success, but at least it is, it is good to refer to uh, uh, so that uh, we can do something uh, correctly. Uh, number two, in general, I always like to tell people it all depends on how you craft the story. Uh, so if you like to explain upfront what your research objectives are, uh, it's fine. And then you explain what are the questions you want to address. Uh, what Argo mentioned is another possibility. Uh, it may not work well for master thesis because examiners, they want to know all this at the, at the beginning. Again, it's not about right and wrong. It, it, it really depends on the situation. There are also situations where after you discuss your research problem, you formulate your research question first. Uh, then based on the questions, then only you explain what are your research objectives. Uh, for my thesis in the past, I used uh, what I just said. Uh, after explaining what the research problem, problems are, then it is the best time in my situation to ask. So what are the uh, driving questions? Uh, then from there, we, we, uh, I, I formulate my research questions. So in general, uh, don't, use, don't do it like a template. This is one chunk. That is another part, you know? Uh, and then there is no continuity. There is no, uh, the flow is bad. So, so avoid that. Uh, if, if, the, if the continuity is there, then I don't think this is a big issue. Uh, even if someone comments on it because he or she believes that you must do it, then you just change, you know? Uh, it is, it is not, not a big problem. All right, so that will be our responses to you rather than a definite answer uh, to you. So you have to consider what is best in your situation. Okay, we still have a few minutes. Uh, let's address all this question. Um, what would be the recommended tool to analyze such data uh, for the school student? Would it be complex ones as SPSS or Google Form or SurveyMonkey? Um, Agong, Rex, what do you think? Um, or do, do we need more clarification uh, for this question? Uh, I think Agong has answered there. Any software you can use, but choose what is familiar, okay? I think that is, that is fair. Uh, there are so many tools and applications out there and Vivo is definitely a very powerful one, uh, but you have to learn how to use it uh, before you can actually utilize all the features. Um, but before using any software, I make sure as a researcher, uh, you, we do our part, you know, uh, because the software, even if you click, if you use SPSS, uh, they can do analyze analysis for you. It does still, it depends on the researchers. Um, so for qualitative software, it does not really analyze the way uh, SPSS does for quantitative data. Uh, so a lot of uh, interpretation uh, still come from, comes from the researcher uh, themselves. If Google Scholar does the job for you, sorry, Google Form does the job for you, why not? Uh, if you need something more sophisticated, of course, you can go for SurveyMonkey and all that. Um, at the end of the day, uh, do what you are familiar with, do something which is appropriate to your study and in your writing, justify. Uh, it's all about justification. Um, 
I see papers using Google Form published in top journal. I see papers using Envivo published in top journals. I also see papers using generic qualitative methods, manually done, published in top journals as well. So do what is best, what is most appropriate to your study, okay? Anything to add uh, on that, uh, Rex, uh, Agong? Uh, Agong, yes, go ahead, Agong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's uh, enough. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Hiram. That's uh, okay. the only words I can say. Uh, we, you can keep your questions coming uh, for the, in, uh, in the afternoon session, even though we will talk about an, another few topics. Feel free to ask any questions related to our discussions in the morning. So we will take a break for an hour. So we will take an hour break. Uh, if you are in Malaysia, the Philippines, it is 12 p.m. right now. So we will be back at 1 p.m. Uh, for another three hour session. Uh, so we will take an hour break. Uh, we will end the Zoom meeting. Um, and, so, and, and, and that means later on at 1 p.m., you need to join uh, the meeting again. All right. So thank you so much. Thank you, Agong. Thank you, Rex. We will see you after an hour. Bye-bye.